Hello, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of The Casual Criminalist. As always, I'm your host, Simon Wemmers here. One of my writers, George, has written me a script. This one is Lamcor Wen. And uh, with a title like that, and The Jars Murderer is the, the subtitle, today's is going to be uh, an episode full of difficult pronunciations. <laughs> I think it's set in Hong Kong. Um, if I remember George's pitch for this originally, something about it. It's definitely a serial killer. <laughs> Good times! Um, the format of this show, George has written this. I've never read it before. We're gonna read it together. Let's go. <laughs> Chen Feng Lan, 22. Chen Yun Ji, 31. Lian Shu Yung, 29. And Lian Hui Xin, 17. <laughs> and I don't know if I've pronounced their names correctly. That these I'm not going to be able to look them up, am I? So, I mean, I suppose I could. Look, these people aren't going to be in my pronunciation dictionary because I assume they're the victims of a serial killer. And then you could use Google Translate to put the names in, but then it's always like, it's just not always right. Anyway, I'm just going to do my best, and by my best, I mean I'm going to guess. Let's go. You're on fire, Paul. What's your secret? I'm guessing! These are the four victims of Hong Kong's first known serial killer and the subject of today's video. Invariably and lamentably, when we, or indeed any piece of true crime media, talk about a serial killer, the victims' names are invariably pushed to the side and priority is instead given to the wicked monster that stole their lives, their dreams and hopes and fears. Who stole everything from them. However much we may wish it could be otherwise, it is to a certain degree unavoidable. The tragedy these four young women endured simply occupies a smaller proportion of the overall narrative. But unavoidable as it may ultimately be, that doesn't mean I, George, as a writer, have to like it. No, no one likes it. And this is the thing. Like, if I. St and while I try to, and I appreciate that people often point this out in the comments, make this show about the stolen lives of the victims rather than the perpetrators, if I start labeling, you know, in, in the titles, just putting the victims' names, and no one is going to discover this channel or the content. So instead, it's you, you have something like The Jars Murderer, which, I mean, it is what it is, isn't it, I suppose. That's exactly why I've chosen to start today's episode in this way. In the style of my, George's videos on Yip Kai Foon and Chong Tsi Kung, I originally penned a rather exciting and adrenaline pumping introduction, teasing you, the audience, with a glimpse of the conclusion of today's story. But on fuller reflection, I didn't really think that would be appropriate. I don't want today's episode to be the story of a contemptible man who slayed four young women in cold blood. Rather, I, George, want today's episode to be a memorialization of four young women who had their lives stolen by a monster. A slight, but I think important distinction. I want you, the audience, to hear their names and see their faces long before you're introduced to today's killer so as to stop their particulars simply disappearing in the flood of new names, faces, information you, the audience, get bombarded with on long-form podcasts such as ours. With that in mind, this episode takes us back to 1982, a time in which the serial killer had been firmly established as a lamentable fixture of the modern world. The USA, the UK, the Soviet Union, India, and Yugoslavia, to name a few, had all contributed their own monsters to the trend. Hong Kong stood out as a notable exception in the serial killer trend. The city, which had, and still to this day, has a bigger population than many small countries, was essentially all but devoid of mass killings since the expulsion of the Japanese in 1945. Now, that's all changed in 1982, the year in which young women started getting into the backs of Hong Kong's famous red taxis and never making it to their destination. Four young women, the aforementioned Chen Fen Lan, Chen Yun Ji, Liang Shu Yung, and Lian Hui Xin would be the luckless victims. Innocent women kidnapped by their taxi driver in the darkest depths of the night before being raped, tortured, cut up, and disposed of either in the Shinmen River or in rice bags, with their killer keeping samples of their anatomy pickled as macabre keepsakes. Worse still, the monster filmed and photographed everything. Yeah, this I just made a video a couple of days ago about um, Myra Hindley, which was, uh, I'm not sure if it'll have aired yet, but if it has, this was one of the most disturbing ones that I've made in a long time. And it was just, they didn't know whether they were filming them, but there's just this part of the script which just gave me chills which was when there's an audio recording of them torturing someone and they hear in the background and they have like an expert try and identify what the sound is and it's the sound of someone like adjusting a tripod for a camera and it's just like 
Even thinking about that now, it's like, oh boy. English speakers know him as the Jars Murderer, Chinese speakers as the Rainy Night Butcher. His name was Lam Kor Wan, and he was Hong Kong's first serial killer. The Photos Today's story starts on August 10, 1982, in British Hong Kong. Sergeant Lo Dejun, the decorated and celebrated commander of the Royal Hong Kong Police Force's Kowloon Regional Homicide Squad, was sat at his desk in the Kwantong Police Station. His vocation was one which rarely brought much immediate joy. Yeah, you're not the police officer who goes and rescues people. You're the police officer who goes after someone's been murdered. It's like, you know, that that's a rough job. His domain was death, and the unfortunate souls who were taken by it much too early. Any time on the counter, Kowloon Peninsula, a life was tragically cut short, Sergeant Lowe and his team were the ones to clean the mess up, both literally and figuratively. Wait, the detective's not the guy who's cleaning up a crime scene. There's that movie. Is it a movie with Samuel Jackson? Where he's a crime scene cleaner? Is it Samuel Jackson? Oh, this movie was a long time ago. I feel like it was. <laughs> I could be getting that confused. And he cleans up crime scenes. And I don't remember anything. I'm not even sure I saw the movie. But I don't think it's the detectives. They call in some special crew who have extremely strong stomachs. We talked about it before. I can't ever imagine being able to do that job. Just cleaning up after murders. A job is a job. <laughs> what was I looking at the other day? For some reason I was... Oh, I had to get... I had a big wasp's nest in my house. And I had to call in like a, a company to remove this wasp's nest. And I'm like browsing around their website. They do pest removal. But they also do like cleaning up after hoarders. And they had these pictures of these apartments that they cleaned up and they were and it was also like biohazard clean up and stuff and i'm like you guys are like from that movie you're the guys who clean up crime scenes and just the pictures of these people's homes that they cleaned up and it was like the kitchen and it was just like it was unbelievable there was just you couldn't see what was going on in the kitchen what the kitchen was you know it was just a room full of stuff and they they'd clean that up imagine in a way I'd hate it, but it would also be quite a, like, quite a satisfying job, I guess. I don't know. Let's carry on. Despite the day-to-day -day misery and sorrow he found himself knee-deep in, he took solace and strength from the good work that he did, helping to keep Hong Kong safe and making sure the foul liches who would take a life were brought to justice. Plus, it could be a hell of a lot worse. He'd often comment while surveying the international news in his daily copy of the Hong Kong Standard that at least he never had to deal with any of those crazy serial killers which seemed to be constantly popping up in the United States. Or at least, he hadn't had to yet. Six minutes past three that afternoon, the trusty government-issued phone that flanked the extreme left side of his desk rang. The work phone of a lead homicide detective rarely brought good news, but he had no reason to suspect this wouldn't be anything untoward, probably another shooting or a gangland incident gone horribly wrong. Imagine poor Sergeant Lowe's shock when the voice on the other side of the line introduced himself as Zhang Sai, the manager of a Kodak store just down the road in Sim Sha Soi. Wait, wait. Kodak is in the uh, the film development company. Are you? Are you? Have you been getting your photos of your murders developed at like the equivalent of a drugstore? That's insane. Surely not. He was calling to report suspicious behavior from one of his regular customers. The customer had explained himself as a photographer who occasionally assisted the mortuary at Queen Elizabeth Hospital in Yao Ma Te by taking their autopsy photos and wanted to use Zhang Sai's services to produce color autopsy photos. Initially, he found nothing about this suspicious. So Zhang Sai happily took the man's money in exchange for services rendered, but he made sure to handle his negatives personally to avoid distressing his colleagues. That is a very weak cover-up. If I was that dude developing those photos, you'd be like, I'm just, and especially like if it's just women in his photos, just young women, I'd be like, yeah, I'm just going to phone up the hospital and just double check that there's this dude working for you. And if there's not, I'm going to remain very, very quiet about it all until I've had a long conversation with the police. <laughs> Hello, police? Zhang Tsai went on to explain to Sergeant Lowe that on the fourth occasion Cam Law Wan visited his Kodak store, in addition to just printing of negatives, he had also requested to have a photo enlarged, a service Zhang Tsai couldn't provide at his branch, so he sent the customer a kilometer up Nathan Road to the Mong Kok branch. An hour or so later, he received a call from the manager of the aforementioned branch. They were panicked, babbling, barely able to speak for the great weight of terror placed upon their tongues. Zhang Tsai calmed them down, and the terrified colleagues did their best to explain the fullest details of horror that had been revealed 
by the photo's enlargement. These were not post-mortem photos. Post-mortems weren't conducted on bedroom floors, nor were chainsaws the tools of a qualified and above-board mortician. What had been discovered were the macabre trophies of a serial killer. How did you kill more than one person when you're getting your photos of your serial killings developed at a drugstore? This is insane. And also, your photos where there's just a chainsaw chilling out in the background, and rather being on a mortician's slab with, like, I don't know, medical equipment, they're on a carpet? Like, what's up? <laughs> Sergeant Lo Dajun listened diligently to Zhang Tai's continued testimony, and he was understandably horrified by the narrative that began to build in his mind. And needless to say, when he finally put the receiver down on poor Mr. Zhang, all hell broke loose within the Royal Hong Kong Police Force. Arrest. Sergeant Lowe had a terrible feeling this wasn't an isolated killing. All of the photos were reportedly of one victim, but what were the odds, he reasoned, that someone who had put in such an extreme effort into making such an elaborate and extreme killing setup had only claimed one victim? What's more, he began to link other recent incidents together, particularly one from a few months prior when parts of a woman had been fished out of the river near Sha Tin. He began to fear, sadly accurately, that he was dealing with Hong Kong's first serial killer. Despite that most foreboding of knowledge, Sergeant Lowe actually had very few leads to follow. Essentially, all he knew was that the killer was a regular customer at the Sim Sa Soi Kodak Express. No one knew his name, his age, nor anything about him at all particularly besides an approximation of his appearance. Street patrols were unlikely to pick up the suspect either, with anywhere from 100 to 150,000 people per square kilometer residing in the area surrounding the stores, the odds of bumping into him on the street were highly unlikely. That's insane. Hong Kong is so densely populated. 150,000 people per square kilometer. 150,000 people is... That's the population of a large-ish town. That's mad. Mercifully, at least, one Dr. Philip Bear, a forensic pathologist in the employ of the Hong Kong police force, did at least manage to successfully ID the victim in the Kodak Express photos, who we already know as 17-year-old Liang Hoi Jin. In a 2011 television interview, he said the following regarding the photos. They were showing bodies, or part of a body, which had been cut open, but not in a way that any of us forensic pathologists recognized as a surgical cut. The usual things you expect with operations, you know, the green tablecloth, the surgical lights, the gloved hands, etc. So this was unusual. Yes, like, why is there no medical equipment? Why are they on a carpet? Is that a chainsaw? Like, f***ing hell. Also, serial killers with chainsaws. Chainsaws are terrifying. I remember I did one of those. Have you guys been to one of those fear houses? You know, when you go in and people try to terrify you? I went to one of those and it was, I was like, I'm not going to be terrified by this because my logic brain is like, I know it's not real, blah, blah, blah. But there's this one point where there's a dude with a f***ing chainsaw chasing you around this like um like the mortuary room or whatever and you're like oh my god what <laughs> and it's that insane part of your brain which says ding 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 what if this is actually when you know this guy did took this job because he's insane and this is the one time that he puts the the chain on the chainsaw and he comes to get you and this chainsaw is so loud and he had that scary hockey mask and it's like it's a real chainsaw you know it's just had the chain taken off or whatever and you can smell the petrol burning inside and you're like oh my god it was so terrifying i'm never doing these things again it's really scary there was however reason for sergeant low and his team to be optimistic as fate was indeed feeling merciful back in 1982 because despite the lack of information on the suspect he still had to collect his photos didn't he he and his team would have to act fast, however, as one could probably decipher from the name Kodak Express, they didn't have long to get into position to intercept their killer. Teams of plain-clothed officers led by Sergeant Lowe surrounded the two Kodak Express branches, eyes ever vigilant, their mission brief was simple. Wait for the nod from the sales assistant and grab the bastard. I feel like, can't you just give them a uniform and have them just pot around the store? <laughs> like just, or have them be the person at the, the film thing and when the guy comes to get his thing, just be like, what's up, bitch? And just draw the gun and be like, down on the ground! It was not long before one of the over 18,000 uniform and indistinguishable taxis that roamed Hong Kong's tight streets slapped on its hazard lights and pulled up beside the Mong Kok Kodak Express. The driver, however, was anything but indistinguishable, both to the audience and the staff of the store. It was Lam Kor Wen. He was immediately recognized by the counter staff as the customer who had brought in the foul negatives of young Lian Hu Shin's remains just a few hours prior. The staff gave 
gave the nod to the plain-clothed officers, who leapt on the odious little man and dragged him, kicking and screaming, into their custody. Needless to say, Labcor Wang didn't exactly take well to accountability, giving him a solid right hook in the jaw, and he continued to throw a deranged tantrum right the way back to the station. When the aforementioned tantrum finally passed, he managed to settle on one really solid story to explain the photos. Um, dude, where are you going to go from here? They've literally found your murder photos. And the fact that George is put really solid in all caps, bold and underlined, makes me feel that it's sarcastic and this guy's a bit dim. We know he's dim because he got his murder photos developed at the drugstore. Look, if you're a murder, if you got, if you want to take murder photos back in like the 1980s or 90s when like before digital, bro, you got to get a dark room. Like, what are you doing? You got to have a dark room. <laughs> That's crazy. He told Sergeant Lowe that they weren't his photos. He claimed the photos belonged to one of his friends who worked on a fishing boat. He had just helped his friends by getting the photos developed. He was innocent. Mate, they are going to get a warrant for your house so fast. And they're going to match up all of you. Like, did you throw away the chainsaw? They're going to find the chainsaw. They're going to match up the floor with your floor. You're, you're so f***. Mate. Oh boy. And as far as Sergeant Lowe was concerned, at that point, that could well be the truth, or at least a shred of it. Other people could well have been involved in the murders, so he allowed him to go to the supposed rendezvous spot so long as two armed plainclothes officers remained within grabbing distance of him at all times. Shockingly, again, bold, all caps, underlined, <laughs> no one arrived, so Lam Wan was duly thrown back in handcuffs and dragged back to the station. While Lam Wan was given, what are you doing? <laughs> You're like, no, no, I gotta go to this rendezvous point. And the police are like, yeah, of course we're going to go with you, like, secretly. And he's like, okay, yeah. At that point, you've got to be like, nah, no one's coming. <laughs> you just go along with it. You just hope it's a random dude's going to show up. Stupid people. While Lam Gor Wan was giving Hong Kong's CID the runaround, Sergeant Lowe's men were checking his taxi, which had been impounded and towed back to the station. Partially hidden in the car's luggage rack, they found a pair of handcuffs and a knife. Peculiar things for a supposedly innocent man to be carrying. <laughs> he's guilty as f***ing sin, mate. With his guilt blatantly evident to every creature blessed with sentience, Lam Kor Wan was taken for further questioning at the Hong Kong police headquarters in Wan Chai. Here he continued to profess his innocence, claiming to have no connection to the girl whose remains he just so happened to have photos of. With Lam Kor Wan now firmly in police custody and babbling his deluded rantings regarding his innocence, let us take a moment to learn about the man himself. Don't be babbling about your innocence. Get a lawyer. Lawyer, 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 lawyer. Always get a lawyer. Call him now. The Killer In what is becoming a recurring theme of the casual criminalist's endeavors into the crime of Hong Kong's past, a preliminary search for information on the Jars murderers will seemingly lead you almost immediately to a dead end of information. Did I mention, I mean, we regular listeners know, uh, George lives in Hong Kong, so... Uh, that's why we have a Hong Kong focus. It's not just George has some deep, random passion about Hong Kong. He lives there. Or, no, he does live there, I think. Or he lived there? I don't remember. Sorry, George. You've mentioned this before, and now I'm pretty sure. Uh, uh, look, let's just move on. <laughs> Rather than embarrass myself with my small brain memory. Countless videos from... Oh, no, he definitely does, because he went to the police station in the last episode. That's right, and he went and he met and he did that research, which was awesome. Not giving George enough credit. Sorry, George. Countless videos from channels with significantly less handsome presenters. Goddamn right. <laughs> and writers. Yes, George. We'll all open with the same monologue. Short and sweet one today, guys, because there's no information. Bramer Hill murders next week. Blah, blah, blah. Throwing some shade, George, aren't we there? No, that's okay. You can, George, because I know you're going to go every, like, any time you do a video that you must read. Do you read those comments, George? I'm talking directly to George, right? I could just email him afterwards. But everyone's like, George, your research is mental. And I love it. But we at The Casual Criminalist ain't having that, ladies and gentlemen in the audience. Casual our presentation may be, but our research is anything but. Veteran viewers of my, George's, videos may remember that I have a particular little research hack that I use when researching Chinese crime. That's right, he's only gone and done it again. Your boy has only gone and read the Chinese sources. Yes, so without further delay, let's jump into the life of today's killer. 
Lam Core Wan. And th today's video is anything but short and sweet. What are we at? 22 minutes? <laughs> We're maybe a fifth of the way through. This is going to be like a two hour one. Born to Lam Weili, his father, and Jiang Jian Ping, his mother. Furthermore, his father was a polygamist and had two further wives in addition to Jian Jian Ping and ten children with his three wives. Jian Jian Ping was Lam Wei Li's main wife, however, and subsequently the head of the household. Oh, wait, they all live together? I didn't know that was a thing in Hong Kong or China or. I Hong Kong, right? We didn't say where he was born, but we'll, let's assume it's in the same place. In turn, the young Lam Kor Wan found himself the inheritor of the family name and legacy, a great burden to bear, but also one that came with relative privileges in the form of extra attention from his father and mothers, as well as generally being prioritized for education. Lam Wei Li, Lam Kor Wan's father, earned a reasonable income in the employ of an oil company. I feel like if you've got three wives, and 10 children, and you live in Hong Kong, which is famously expensive, you've got to have a good income. <laughs> like, how else are you affording that? This often took the family to Brunei, and indeed the Lam family resided there full time from 1957 to 1962 before they permanently relocated back to Hong Kong in December of 1962. Lam Kor Wan's early years there were strict and regimented. His father, Lam Wei Li, maintained a strict borderline military discipline in the household. Chores and homework were expected to be completed to the highest standard, and strict physical punishment would be regularly doled out for failing to meet Father Lam's high standards. There was no escape from this disciplinary standard at school either, as both the Chinese kindergarten and the primary school the young boy studied in at Brunei and St. Matthew's Primary School in Hong Kong from 1962. These schools weren't exactly institutions that could be accused of wrapping their students in cotton wool, rather dressing their wounds with it after the students taking a battering from their teachers. Holy sh**. Despite, or maybe because of the strict environment, the young Lam Kor Wan initially excelled at school and his grades across the board were consistently in the top 10 of his intake. This promising academic streak was not to last, however, as in 1968, Lam Kor Wan's father got a new job with CLP Power Hong Kong Limited and the family relocated to Sham Shui Po. In 1970, Lam Kor Wan's father also opened a motorcycle shop on Hong Ning Road, Quan Tong, and insisted that the young boy help to run the shop after his daily classes. And thus began a terminal academic decline for the young boy, in which his father, Lam Wei Li, as the ever-demanding family patriarch, demanded his son's labor after school every day, which ate into his study time and made his son's grades collapse, and then he would be furiously chastised, beaten, and berated by his father for getting declining grades. Mate, that is some parenting right there. It's like, why are your grades going to dad? Because I have to work on motorbikes after school when I should be doing my homework. I'll beat you. <laughs> This collapsing relationship was not exclusive to Lam Kor Wan either. In an interview conducted with Hua Kuo Daily in 1983, Zhang Jianping, family matriarch and Lam Wei Li's primary wife, admitted that following the family's return from Brunei in 1962, there was a gradually growing dissatisfaction and lack of contentedness from Lam Wei Li, which he duly took out on his family, causing the near total collapse of his close and cordial family bonds. Despite Lam Kor Wan's turbulent home life he graduated high school just about and began working full-time in his father's motorcycle shop on Hong Ning Road. He then secured an apprenticeship as an air conditioning engineer. Now, sadly for you, as reaching adulthood is where Lam Kor Wan's story takes a firmly dark turn, as this is where we begin to find the first evidence of his dark side. Was this side to him always present and just went unrecorded in his youth, or did something happen to the young man which brought it out in early adulthood? I mean, always good questions, like, always come back when we have, like, some psycho serial killer like this. Are they born or are they made? Rough childhood almost always amplifies stuff. I don't think this is one of those childhoods that it's so he got a bit beaten by his teachers and his dad, and it sounds like a bit miserable, but it's not by anywhere close to the worst upbringing we've heard of so i don't know it's like more natural like more born and then this just amplified a little bit look ultimately we don't know and thus we're left to simply speculate from the story that we can cobble together personally i george didn't see any obvious tells in lam Kor wan's early years that hinted at him becoming a vessel of such unmitigated evil did i miss something can our dashing presenter and you the audience see something that i George missed. I mean, well, no, there's been like nothing particularly to indicate it other than the, you know, slightly rougher than most childhood. Um, there's no, the classic stuff, killing cats, animals, torturing animals, that kind of stuff. 
hardcore like proper like i don't want to say that getting beaten because you're getting bad grades is not proper abuse but like you know let turning that turning that scale up a little bit sort of abuse there's not that as far as we know but let's pause the biography here and pick lam kor wan's story back up later on so that we can view his entire criminal history in full clear and unbroken context so for now let's go back to the team investigating his apartments i really admire this george i find it so hard to write i'm bad at writing anyway which is why i have other people write my stuff but to keep two threads going where you jump back and forward in time and keep it coherent is really hard and i'm very impressed that i'm following along with no worries despite these jumps in time it's really nice well done the apartment hong kong police with their keen noses for bullshit naturally weren't having any of Lam Kor Wan's excuses during questioning, so they duly sent CID to his apartment. Now, I imagine no police officer relishes going to search the apartment of a man found in possession of murder photography, but even with this foresight, I doubt any of the officers were ready for the abject image of horror that they would uncover. There's no nice way to sugarcoat this section, dear viewers. What you are about to hear is absolutely horrifying stuff. And as ever, as a writer, I, George, have to find the precious balance on one hand of not glamorizing or fetishizing the ordeal suffered by Chen Feng Lan, Chen Yunji, Liang Zhu Yong, and Liang Hui Xin, but at the same time also not toning down the details to such a great extent that it belittles or dismisses what they endured. With that in mind, I've opted to let Senior Inspector Martin Richmond, who led the search of Lam Kor Wan's apartment, do the bulk of the storytelling in this chapter with myself only providing minimal supplementary commentary. There will be no flamboyant metaphors nor dramatic imagery in this chapter, just simple, quick, clean facts which lay out exactly what was discovered. It's the jar's murderer's lair, after all. You could probably have an accurate guess as to what was found. Yes, Jen, if you can somehow magic the timestamp where this section ends on the screen now, that would be amazing. Thank you. You're welcome. So with that out of the way, let's hand it over to Senior Inspector Richmond to tell us what the police discovered in Flat B on the first floor of the Ung Hing building in Tukwa Wan. Quote begins. This apartment was a first floor walk-up flat in quite an old building. The actual area of the flat itself was quite small, probably 400, 500 square feet. And within that area, quite typical for Hong Kong at the time, you had a whole family living within that small flat. Lamb's room was directly opposite the entrance door, and that room in particular was indeed much smaller, probably 10 feet by about 5 to 6 feet. Very small indeed. There were suitcases, photographic equipment, and recording equipment. There were a great number of books. Over the course of the search of the room, we disclosed what for an individual would be a very large amount of personal photographic equipment. Given that we knew Lam was employed as a taxi driver, some of it was very expensive, and he must have saved very hard to obtain it. We then found the evidence. This was in the form of a military ammunition box, and it appeared to me that this large box had appeared in the photographs which had been taken from Kodak, so oh, we were fairly sure that the room had been used in some way to take the photographs which had been seized. Dude, this is exactly what I said. You like, these aren't my photos. They're gonna go to your apartment and they're gonna find out that they are. Get her, come up with a better excuse, good lord. Or just admit to it, you sicko. Inside the ammunition box was a large stash of pornography, anatomical books, and thousands of photographs of Chen Fen Lan's, Chen Yun Ji's, and Liang Shu Yung's remains. Furthermore, the team found dozens of what appeared to be amateur videotapes, a red lady's handbag, and a pair of white high-heeled shoes. Right at the bottom of the ammunition box was a full complement of surgical equipment. The photos of Chen Fen Lan, Lam Kor Wang's first victim, were subsequently used to identify the aforementioned remains that washed up outside Sha Tin. And now let's continue with Martin Richmond's quote. Under the bed, we found some plastic food containers. They were sealed, and as the masking tape was taken from the seal and they were opened, we could see they contained some strong-smelling liquid. It appeared to be some kind of formaldehyde or preservative fluid. In the containers, certainly, were body parts. It seemed to me, on reflection, that at least one of the containers contained a severed female breast. One of the containers contained pubic parts. It was quite horrific at the time, and it's certainly something I will never forget. Dr. Philip Burr's team carried out the search and took four days to conduct a full forensic sweep of the apartment. He had the following to say on the matter, quote, There was an initial sort of awe of silence. 
everyone was so well i suppose shocked or surprised about the things that they found in that room besides the photographs and remains inside the military ammunition case the team also discovered female pubic hair littered around the room's peripheries as well as small specks of blood and flesh on the walls subsequent investigations with their killer now arrested and a literal trunk load of evidence now sat in the evidence locker sergeant lo da jun and his officers in the royal hong kong police forces kowloon regional homicide squad now had the incredibly unenviable task of piecing all of this evidence together into an accurate and clear understanding of what the hell lam kor wan had actually done and to whom they started with the incredibly pragmatic choice of arresting lam korwan's male family members who also resided in the apartment lam wei li lam korwan's father as well as lam kor kung his half brother through one of his father's other wives after all to quote senior inspector martin richmond it would have astonished anybody at the time to think that a single person could have been capable of achieving what lam kor wan achieved on his own that's why the male members of his family fell under considerable suspicion in custody and under the constant barrage of intense police interrogation lam kor wan continued to plead his innocence mate <laughs> Are you not aware of quite how much evidence is stacked up against you? On the 18th of April 1982, police instead shifted their main focus to his father and his half brother. The testimony of the latter, particularly, was much more readily forthcoming than that of Lam Kor Wan and revealed some fascinating, albeit disturbing, insights into the mind of the killer. In senior inspector Richmond's words, his younger brother had a very strange relationship with Lam Kor Wan. He was a very secretive person, although they shared this tiny room. His brother really only used it for sleeping, putting his head down overnight the brother told us that if he touched anything particularly any of lamb corwan's camera equipment and his records he would get a good thrashing he was astonished to realize what had been going on in that room he was horrified so you heard that correctly folks in the audience lamb Kor kung claimed to have absolutely no idea what had been happening in the 60 square foot room that he called his own perhaps more shockingly still he wasn't lying interviewing officers reported a genuine shock and disgust in his face when discovering his brother's crimes way too genuine and long-lasting to be a facade dude a 60 foot room isn't that like six square meters that's insane it's like the size of a cupboard and he had no idea what was that there was all these weird shit in there come on i mean i guess what we have to believe it because we, it seems to be a fact but jesus furthermore his alibi checked out lam kor kung gave a stream of contacts friends and connections details to the police and every single one of them vouched that lam kor kung basically did naught at the apartment but sleep he was always out always working legitimately never anywhere near the place in any meaningful capacity in a subsequent television interview sergeant lowe gave the following testimony on the matter lamb's brother and father were completely shocked they genuinely had absolutely no idea about lamb's actions it sounds crazy right but it makes sense the opposing work schedules lamb's standoffish defensiveness of his belongings you can see how it happens the family's testimonies placed the spotlight firmly back on Lam Kor Wan, who, even in the face of ever-mounting evidence that pointed a huge neon-illuminated arrow of guilt squarely at him, maintained a facade of calmness, disconnection, and apathy towards the police's proceedings. In Inspector Richmond's words, he appeared to be somewhat devoid of much emotion. No doubt he was obviously thinking ahead to anticipate the type of questions that would be asked. He knew what was in his room. He knew that it would be disclosed also do i have it right they live in this tiny apartment and there's a family i know there's a family living in this tiny apartment that was like 50 square meters or 500 square feet or whatever is this a family with 10 kids three wives one husband that's an awful lot of people living in a very very small apartment i'm thinking about the size of my apartment it's like well it's a lot bigger than that <laughs> and there's only four of us and two of them as really small kids despite the overwhelming cascade of circumstantial evidence that pointed to lamb Kor wan however without a solid and damning piece of evidence that could be used to confidently nail a conviction the police could only hold him for two days um a solid piece of evidence to secure a conviction are you me there's pieces of flesh on his bedroom walls this this is a isn't this a lock police naturally the men and women of the hong kong police force would rather 
clapped in their hands and clapped and let Lam Kor Wan slip away, so they once again intensified and refocused their investigation. Desperate for more evidence, the police assembled a small army of strong stomached investigators and divided the tapes and photographs recovered from Lam Kor Wan's room among them, desperate to get every cell and every frame catalogued, identified, and analyzed before their two days were up and their killer inevitably disappeared. Why would they disappear? I know this is like the past and stuff, and there's not like ankle monitors and whatnot, but can't you just have a police officer follow him around? Because it's like, this is your first serial killer. I feel like you could afford like, what, three people, eight hours each, 24 hours a day, just keeping an eye on him, standing outside his door, making sure he doesn't like cross the border and flee to China or whatever. Oh my. You know, it's, it's a hard job. In the late hours of the 17th of August 1982, the day of Lam Kor Wan's arrest, that very army of investigators, fueled by liberal lashings of strong coffee, found their key piece of evidence that would let them nail the bastard. How strong is this going to be, given that I'm already like, the evidence is super strong. If I was on a jury, I'd be like, do they kill people in Hong Kong? <laughs> I'd be like, guilty! Guilty! This is gonna be, uh, this has gotta be mega strong. They discovered a multiple angle camera recording which showed Lam Kor Wan taking photos of the deceased naked woman on the floor of his bedroom. It is best described by Dr. Philip Bear. What struck me was one, it was a homemade video. In 1982 in Hong Kong, at least very few people I knew of had home video cameras, never mind making videos themselves. You see him moving around, and not only was he videoing, he was taking photos. Because you could see that with the flash that goes off every time he was trying to take photos. The frightening photo shoot eventually escalated into a dissection. Quote, You are actually observing almost a dissection of the body in the bedroom floor of someone's house. When it came to the second dead body, you could see that he had improved. He was cutting more deliberately. He knew perhaps how deep he wanted to cut into some of the parts. At that time, what needed to be answered was that you had body parts that were kept and were found in this room. Who were they? It's presumptuous to suggest that they necessarily came from the victim in the video. Yeah, a multi-camera angle of you dissecting a body in your bedroom floor um, is, yeah, that's that's a lock. We were already at lock, and that is like the triple lock. Boom. Guilty. What the police really needed now to nail their case. Guys, you nailed the case. <laughs> what, you want a quadruple lockdown? Uh, was a confession. Responsibility for it fell upon senior inspector Martin Richmond, who commented the following, Lamb had been arrested on suspicion of murder. If sufficient evidence had not been available with which to charge him within 48 hours, we would have had to have released him. After trying multiple different avenues and provocations to draw a confession from Lam Kor Wan, Sergeant Lo Da Jun and his team finally found a winning strategy. Quote, Lam Kor Wan wanted to know if the photographs found in his house would be revealed to the public. We replied that we would let the world know what he had done and release all evidence to the media. The threat of the full and uncensored brutality of his crimes being aired for all to see was enough to make the previously stone-faced Lam Kor Wan throw in the towel and concede to Sergeant Lowe's demand for a confession. And there's a note here. Cracking blag from Sergeant Lowe, it has to be said, because of course they were never going to release the victim's photos without consent of the surviving families, and those surviving families are never going to give it. Yeah, this is an absolute blag. And also, it's, it's a bit of a it's a bit of a risk, isn't it? Because this he could be one of those sickos, sickos who's like, no, nah, I want them to be released. I want people to see what I did. I want people to know how depraved I am because I'm weird. Anyway, he confessed to everything. The Confession Lam Kor Wan's confession really ended up being quite the candid and exhaustive declaration. He took it upon himself to give a full declaration of not only his four killings, but the full details of his criminal history, as well as the events and circumstances in his life that brought him to them. Between this testimony, as well as that of his family and friends provided to both the police during the investigation and the media following Lam Kor Wan's rise to infamy, were able to build a very clear picture of the man. His testimony began right the way back in 1973, the first time he was kicked out of the family home following a particularly aggressive argument with his father. He claims this confrontation left him feeling angry and emasculated. He needed to assert his masculinity to feel strong and in control again. After an hour of pacing and ranting to himself, he was at the verge of completely snapping. He claims not to remember how he got there or how he came to be armed, but suddenly he was standing by the public toilets on Hock Yuen Street in Hung Hom District with a knife firmly grasped in his palm, which he used to coerce a passing woman into the public toilets 
and molester. Fortunately, he was arrested before he could do anything further, but there is clashing testimony between Lam Kor Wan's own confession and period articles about whether or not he was interrupted by the police. One says they raced the girl's aid upon hearing the sound of a struggle, another says that she managed to slip free and flag the police down. Following his arrest and charging with sexual assault, a police psychiatrist deemed that he was mentally unfit to stand trial and was instead sentenced to Castle Peak Psychiatric Hospital for treatment and subsequently released after 102 days of treatment. Tragically, the spell in Castle Peak Psychiatric Hospital did all but naught to abet the violent sexual deviancy of Lam Kor Wan. Yeah, that's a shame because I feel like at that point, that's where he needs to go. Like, he had some sort of episode, at least prima facie to the people investigating at that point it seems he did have some sort of mental episode and needs to be treated for that i kind of agree with that decision it's just a shame that apparently the psychiatric hospital didn't you know really realize what was going on and uh maybe give him some better drugs although it's 1974 did they really have good drugs or was it kind of just like i don't know those old drugs where they're just like how would we treat this psychiatric problem i'll just like numb them up just give them like lithium or whatever it is is it lithium What's that one that just makes people, like, chill? <laughs> Alcohol, Valium, Ativan, Trazodone. In 1974, the then 19-year-old Lam Kor Wan was noted as having an unusual and unhealthy obsession with women, limited not just to a dirty collection of magazines stuffed under his mattress, nor the occasional visit to Hong Kong's many brothels. No, his sexual obsessions, which he happily boasted of and proclaimed around his family, were far more violent in nature. That's weird, dude. Why are you talking about your sexual obsessions around your family? Especially when your sexual obsessions are violent. Jesus. His family's tolerance for such worrying behavior finally ran out when he was found peeping on and masturbating to his sister while she used the bathroom. Holy sh Yeah, dude. You gotta go back to Castle Rock. Uh, what was it? Castle Peak. You gotta go back, my man. That is not right. The fallout of this discovery caused the orbit total collapse of his family, with his father still unwilling to cut him off or make any meaningful intervention at all. Lam Kor Wan was instead expelled from the family home in Quan Tong and moved to the apartment in Ta Kwa Wan with his brother and father following him. Wait, that does. Didn't we just say that his father was unwilling to make any meaningful intervention except throwing him out of the family house? That seems like a pretty intense intervention. The family's motivation behind this is unclear, as accounts are split on the matter, with some claiming the male members of the family went to keep an eye on him, with others saying the stress of Lam Kor Wan's sexual deviancy caused the complete collapse of the family, with the male members being expelled for not suitably condemning Lam Kor Wan. The next few years appeared to have been fairly quiet for Lam Kor Wan's crimes, or at least for crimes he has either admitted to or can be blatantly attributed to him. Two crucial developments for our story did occur in the years 1974 to 1980. Firstly, Lam Kor Wan earned his taxi license in 1978 and became a night shift taxi driver in 1980. That made him all but totally removed from his family, who due to the opposing work schedules would only actually have a meaningful conversation every week or so. Secondly, in 1981, he discovered his passion for photography joining a local photography club and investing heavily in the expensive and sophisticated setup which we're already tragically familiar with. With his newfound passion for photography, he also started a little side hustle, photographing and filming for Hong Kong's porn scene. I feel like this guy, is it not on his record? Do you, like, if you're going to be a, a photographer for, like, porn, isn't there going to be some sort of background check to make sure you're not a weirdo? Because this guy has like two pretty weird things going on on his record and i'll be like that is not the guy who you want working on a porn set because you want someone who is i don't know professional rather than some guy who's probably going to be like jerking it off in the corner like a, I mean <laughs> getting a bit graphic there but it's like this guy's a weirdo you don't want a weirdo on that job <laughs> it's just not right by late 1981 to early 1982, just on the eve of his murders, we know that Lam Kor Wan was all but totally estranged from his mother and female siblings. Shocking. With his mother refusing to wash his clothes, let him use the old family apartment for showers, or allow any female members of the family to be alone with him. Again, th th there's just nothing shocking about that, because he's a weirdo. All the pieces had now fallen into place, and tragically, it was only a matter of time until he claimed his first victim. Chen Fen Lan. Chen Fen Lan, the first victim. With Lam Kor Wan's escalating violent sexual tendencies going all but unchecked, the inevitable happened, and soon enough, 
he began killing. A little over six months before his fateful trip to Kodak Express on the 3rd of February 1982, Lam Kor Wan was driving his taxi down Kimberley Road in Sim Sa Sui. It was late, and he was trying to find one more fare before calling it a night, lingering around Nutsford Terrace, a popular party district for both locals and foreigners alike. In his glove box was a length of steel cable. He knew what he was going to do. All he was lacking was the opportunity which tragically would come soon enough. Senior Inspector Martin Richmond gave some insight on his behavior during this time to quote, He would know that when the clubs were closing, when the entertainment establishments were closing, a lot of single women would be emerging from those places. Likewise, he would place himself in taxi queues and places where women like that might be wanting to get a cab home. Precisely what happened in the case of the first victim. A young woman emerged from a nightclub at 4 a.m. Her name, Chen Feng Lan, a 22-year-old dancer in the employ of one of the aforementioned nightclubs. To quote again, she had come out from work and, in fact, was, we understand from her sister, who met her after work, was the worse for wear. She'd had quite a lot to drink. Her sister tried to persuade her to go home with her. She refused and was last seen walking up the line of taxis. But she was actually refused entry by a couple of taxis because she was in quite a state. Eventually, she got into either the third or fourth, which we now know to be Lam Kor Wan's. Sergeant Loy believed Lam Kor Wan hadn't truly committed to the idea of murder yet, thinking it was one thing, but doing it is something else entirely. Tragically, he believed Chen Fen Lan's fate may have been sealed by her annoying Lam Kor Wan. To quote, she had been drunk at the time, so she had made him drive in all sorts of directions. This had annoyed him. At one point, she even threw up in his vehicle. Sadly, off-put Lam Kor Wan may have been. Fate was not smiling on poor Chen Fan Lan that day, and a drunken Duer Machina was not enough to save her from his wicked hands. As Martin Richmond went on to explain, Lam told us this was something which he found rather offensive, and something which he felt might stop him from going home with what he was thinking. He snapped, then, all in a rush, he said that he went round and strangled her. When she was killed, Lam used a sack, which he had in the boot of the taxi, and he put the body in the sack. With the deed done, Lam backed his taxi up to his apartment. It was nearly 5 a.m. and the streets were completely empty. Not a soul nor witness could interrupt him. He does not desecrate poor Chen Feng Lan's remains just yet, however, as not even his bedroom, never mind the whole flat, were empty. Remember, he shared a room with his brother, who worked days and was fast asleep in the room. So instead, he stored Chen Feng Lan under the sofa, went to bed, and waited for sunrise when the apartment would vacate. Soon enough, it did, as both his father and brother left for work, and after stealing 500 Hong Kong dollars from Chen Feng Lan's wallet, he purchased a chainsaw and set about his task. You'll be really pleased to hear, to you that I'm going to gloss over the gory details. If you really want to know, you could find the details online, but I, George, strongly advise against it, as my own delve into the matter frankly left me feeling a bit bad for a few days. Yep, I'm also glad. Thanks, George. I don't like it when these linger with me for days or months. They do sometimes it's not nice yeah that's right in short he did exactly what you'd imagine he'd do having just purchased a chainsaw he also filmed and photographed the entire process when finished most of chen fen lan's remains were unceremoniously stuffed into a plastic bag and discarded on a hillside in fo tan with her sexual organs being kept and preserved in jars filled with baiju curiously he also taped over chen fen lan's eyes as he and i quote didn't want her looking at me. If you recall from earlier in the video, Chen Fen Lan washed up on the shore of Sha Tin shortly afterwards, and after seeing the headlines, Lam Kor Wan, who hadn't been deterred from killing at all after he claimed his first victim, decided he needed to refine his methods when he claimed his next victim. Chen Yun Ji, the second victim. It took just under four months until Lam Kor Wan claimed his next victim, the greatest length of time between any of his killings. This was not due to any moral quandary on Lam Kor Wan's part. He had a clear conscience. No guilt racked him. He lost not a single night of sleep pondering his barbaric deeds. Oh yes, the classic psycho. Instead, this delay was because Lam Kor Wan was hitting the books. He enjoyed his new horrible hobby quite thoroughly and was intent on continuing as long as possible. With that in mind, he began studying anatomical textbooks, trying to learn how to dismember a body as quickly and as cleanly as possible. He also upgraded his equipment. A chainsaw was far too loud, brutish and messy, he concluded, so he invested in a full set of surgical equipment. Some dude who's buying a chainsaw one. I know this is the past, so you can't track that stuff. And obviously, you probably even can't track it very easily today. But if there's somebody who's buying a chainsaw one week and the next week is like buying surgical equipment, put them on a list. They should definitely be on some sort of list. 
Bizarrely, he also continued his photography, documenting his preparations and research for his next victims to an almost bizarre degree. Senior Inspector Martin Richmond, who had the unenviable task of examining all of his photos, commented the following on Lam Kor Wan's extensive documentation. Quote, he kept records of everything, which from a homicide investigator's point of view was absolutely marvelous. He kept records of receipts from shops where he bought surgical equipment. He had a huge number of photographs of what had been going on, and perhaps video was just the next step. A record of what he was doing, end quote. So, with his tools and technique now upgraded, there was just one thing Lam Kor Wan needed to figure out. Disposal. The river was obviously a no-go. It had only taken a week for Chen Feng Lan's remains to be discovered. After combing the length and breadth of the city during his off hours, eventually he found Tai Hang Road. This long road started low in the densely packed streets of Tai Hang Causeway Bridge and wound up through the thickly wooded and deserted peaks of Jardine's Lookout and Mount Nicholson. The latter point of the road, he reasoned, would be perfect for disposal. Tragically, this meant that Lam Kor Wan's terrible to-do list was completed, and with his knowledge, tools, and disposal methods all honed and refined, it was only a matter of time before he claimed his second victim, Chen Yong Ji. Chen Yunji was a 31-year-old cashier employed by 7-Eleven. On the 29th of May 1982, she was working the night shift at Wong Tai Sin, and after clocking off at 5 a.m., she decided to get a taxi home to avoid the relentless storm that was beating down upon the city. Unfortunately for her, the taxi that stopped to pick her up was driven by Lam Kor Wen. His methods were now fully refined. Any shred of hesitancy that may have lingered in him fully extinguished by his first kill, and so with closing of the taxi door and the thud of the door locks, the poor girl's terrible fate was sealed. Wong Tai Sin sat on the edge of the Kowloon Peninsula's metropolitan mass, so Lam Kor Wan took a northerly division up Sha Tin Pass. Then, at that point, when completely alone, he pounced, strangling Chen Yun Ji with the same length of wire that had taken Chen Feng Lan's life. Once again, the poor victim's remains were shoved into a rice sack, hurried back to Lam Kor Wan's apartment, and hidden. With daybreak came solitude as the small apartment emptied. Chen Yun Ji was cut up with Lam Kor Wan's new surgical tools. The sexual organs kept as trophies and jars filled with baiju. And of course, the whole sick process was filmed and photographed for Lam Kor Wan's perverse pleasure. On the tape, Lam Kor Wan scribbled the title, Serious Secrets. With the deed done, the remainder of Chen Yunji was thrown back into the rice sack and dumped at Lam Kor Wan's new spot on Tai Hang Road. Once again, if you really want to know more, further details of Chen Yunji's killings are available online, but we shan't be dwelling on them here. Thank you, George. 100% agree. This was enough. I don't, I don't need more graphic details than that. We know what happens. Thank you for keeping it CSI and not sore. Liang Shu Yong, the third victim. If Chen Feng Lan, Lam Kor Wan's first victim, was a semi-improvised heat-of-the-moment affair, then Chen Yunji, his second victim, was more refined and carefully planned out. The taking of his third victim, Wan Liang Shu Yong, would appear to be a point where Lam Kor Wan was comfortable enough with killing to begin to really revel in the sadistic pleasure of his barbarism. It began at 4 a.m. on the 17th of July, 1982, when Liang Yung, a 29-year-old overnight cleaner at Li Cheng Uk shopping mall, clocked off work for the night. Once again, it was raining heavily and relentlessly, and the young woman decided to treat herself to a taxi home to avoid getting soaking wet. That taxi, of course, was driven by Lam Kor Wan. She gave him a destination, and as the taxi set off, all appeared well and normal. For a time, anyways, that facade of normality dropped in an instant when Lam Kor Wan turned towards his passenger and, with a wide, devilish, ear to ear grin on his face, asked her a question Are you interested in a special program? Young Liang Shu Yong must have immediately sensed the danger she was in, as according to Lam Kor Wan's testimony, this question was promptly and profusely shot down. I'm not in the mood for anything weird. Just get me home. Lam Kor Wan stood down and claimed to be doing just that, but of course he wasn't. He pulled the taxi down a secluded alleyway, and Liang Shu Yong met the exact same fate as Chen Fen Lang and Chen Yun Ji. You know what happened next. Liang Shu Yong's killing followed the exact same general pattern as the two that came before her, with two changes to the routine. The first being an attempted rape, which she managed to heroically fight off, and also cannibalism just got, gets worse, doesn't it? Just throw that, just a little bit of cannibalism in there.
Mercifully, however, Lam Kor Wan only dipped his toes into cannibalism and didn't succumb to the full horror of the other famous cannibal killers like Jeffrey Dahmer. He tried a little bit and spat it out after finding it absolutely unstomachable. He never tried it again. And of course, the dissection was filmed and photographed once more. The name on this tape, Operation Rainy Night. Liang Hu Jin, the fourth victim. Lam Kor Wan's fourth and final victim was Liang Hu Jin, a 17-year-old fifth-form student who studied at Sir Francis Canossian College, Wan Chai. This is a little note here for me, which I'll read. There's some confusion over Liang Hu Jin's background in Chinese sources. Most Lister as a student at Sir Francis Canossian College is mentioned in the main body of the script, but some Lister as a freshman at Hong Kong Baptist University. She's only 17. I find the latter notion hard to believe, so I've opted to list her as at St. Francis's Canossian College instead. Okay, well noted. Her killing, however, would prove different from that of Chen Feng Lang, Chen Yun Ji, and Liang Shu Yung. On the 2nd of July 1982, at around 11 pm, she left the Sheraton Hotel in Sim Sa Sui, having spent the evening attending a teacher appreciation banquet. Her mother had given her the money for a taxi. It was no more than 1.5 kilometers from the hotel to the family home in Valley Road Village, but it was late, and the area was then poorly served by the MTR rail network, and she wanted to make sure that her daughter got home safely. Senior Inspector Martin Richmond commented the following on Lian Hu Xin. To quote, There was some degree of similarity between the first three victims. They all worked in the entertainment industry. It was only when this young lady, Liang Hui Xin, got into his cab that he realized perhaps she was first and foremost as old as the other victims, nor was she intoxicated, nor was she perhaps dressed in a way that suggested she was a hostess or a waitress from a lounge. Wait, that she wasn't as old? Or she was? Um, weird. Okay. Anyway. Lam Kor Wan began talking to her. They discussed a vast multitude of topics, both deep and surface level. School, hope, dreams, family, religion, spirituality. Wait, it's a 1.5 kilometer taxi journey. <laughs> That's a lot of conversation in a very short journey. Some commentators speculate that for some reason Lam Kor Wan took more of a shine to Liang Hu Jin, if for no other reason due to the fact that he was a man driven by intense sexual depravity, and in his clutches he just happened to have a younger girl. Others speculate that this in-depth conversation was simply a ruse to make Liang Hu Jin put her guard down. Either way, we'll never know. And either way, intentional or not, Liang Hui Xin's guard was down enough that she did not recognize the buildings beyond her window, becoming less and less familiar. It was only when the taxi left the metropolitan mass of Kowloon Peninsula and found itself surrounded by trees that Liang Hui Xin realized that something was wrong and she began to panic. She pleaded for her safety and to be taken home, but it was to no avail. Lam Kor Wan stopped the car, handcuffed her. Her whole being saturated by terror, Lian Hui Xin continued to plead. She offered money, her body, anything to end the ordeal. But he didn't kill her yet. Whereas his past victims have been rather quick and prompt affairs, with him only revealing himself when he was ready to kill, this time he drove around for hours and continued to talk to Lian Hui Xin. Eventually, a bizarre calmness permeated the taxi and she began talking calmly again. So calm was the situation that apparently the pair both fell asleep at one point, with the poor Liang Hui Xin still handcuffed in the back of the taxi. He claimed to have some hesitancy to kill her before being overcome with an overwhelming survival instinct that wanted to ensure that he stayed on the free side of the bars. To quote, All in a rush. It happened all in a rush. I had to do it all in a rush. He killed her in the usual manner, and despite all of his supposed claims about caring for Lian Hui Xin, he had no hesitancy in going through his usual post-kill routine, cutting off her sexual organs, preserving them, and filming the entire process, but not before he added a new, even more sickening component to his regiment, necrophilia. We're just hitting all of them today, aren't we? Murder, rape, torture, um, cannibalism, necrophilia. Brilliant. Well, I, torture? No, because he kills them first, which is more mercies, Jesus. Sergeant Lowe had no time for these notions of caring, believing that Lam Kor Wan was fully aware of what he was doing, stating, He looked directly into the camera and smiled. I believe that it was a very cruel smile, and one that I will never forget. According to Senior Inspector Martin Richmond, who received Lam Kor Wan's testimony on the matter, the young girl was in a terrified state and was pleading with him to let her go, and he says that he did feel remorse for her about what was going on. Recovery and Continued Confession 
Following Lam Kor Wan's confession, the Hong Kong police put maximum priority and all available assets towards the recovery of Chen Yun Ji's Liang Shu Yung and Liang Hu Jing's remains from the Tai Hang Road, both to gather more evidence and to aid in the prosecution and to allow them to have a dignified burial. The search began on the 21st of August 1982, three days after Lam Kor Wan's arrest, with the Royal Hong Kong Regiment and British Forces Overseas Hong Kong lending manpower to assist with the search. Lam was convinced to draw up a map of where he believed he had dumped the bodies. <laughs> George has put convinced in all caps there, implying, I don't know, he was convinced. Draw a map! <laughs> and after officers began to get frustrated with the slow rate of recovery, he was bagged and bound and made to lead officers to the bodies personally. Two bodies were recovered over as many days, the first being Chen Yung Ji and the second being Liang Hu Jin, the 17-year-old girl whose photos were recovered by police in the Mong Kok Kodak store. Both were found in the fetal position, squeezed inside of rice sacks. If you really want to know, you can find details of the condition online, but we'll not be going into that here. Lam Kor Wan continued to give further details following the recovery of Chen Yun Ji's and Liang Hui Xin's remains from Tai Hang Road, and a few days later, Liang Shi Yung's remains were recovered. The Trial Despite the overwhelming amount of damning evidence, as well as the confession that quite clearly proved Lam Kor Wan to be the killer, the sheer amount of evidence that had to be documented, recorded, and logged delayed proceedings and meant that it took over six months for the investigation to close and be ready to go to trial. Finally, however, after countless sleepless nights and untold hours of overtime fueled by endless gallons of coffee, the police concluded their investigation and Lam Kor Wan was finally set to face trial on the 3rd of March 1983. The streets surrounding the former French Mission building, which housed the Supreme Court from 1980 to 1983, were packed shoulder to shoulder with members of the press, members of the public, and police officers desperately trying to keep order as emotions flared in the crowd. Inside, Lam Kor Wan was met by an all-male jury as the colonial authorities deemed the thousands of pieces of gory evidence too distressing for women to view. The colonial crown prosecution accused Lam Kor Wan of murdering four women, and over the next three weeks, his own photographs and videotapes were brought before the jury one by one as the crown argued its clear-cut case against him. 696 color negatives, 1,500 color slides, 1,900 meticulously labeled photos, and three videotapes showing the dissection of the victims. Upon submitting his plea, Lam Kor Wan pled not guilty to murder, but guilty to manslaughter, mate. <laughs> there are videos of you dissecting people that you murdered. Who is your lawyer? What? what ma for real? Bizarrely, he claimed to be a prophet from God who killed on God's instructions. He also dubbed himself the Rainy Night Killer, which stuck as his nickname in the Chinese media, claiming that the Rainy Nights brought with them an unquenchable thirst for killing from deep within him. Oh, so he's going for the insanity defense, which seems, again, risky. You'd just be locked up forever. Although maybe they won't kill you. Hong Kong's got death penalty at this time, right? They're gonna, they're gonna, they're gonna hang him or whatever they do. For those interested, I, George, happen to think that this plea of insanity is absolute bollocks. A simple, ineffective, and transparent attempt to shirk some responsibility for his crimes. Totally agree, George. I think you're bang on. Senior Inspector Martin Richmond agrees with me too, at least to a degree, commenting, It could well be a fabrication of a clever person trying to make it look as though he'd been compelled to do things. I don't think, Martin, I think you're giving him too much credit, mate. I don't think it's that clever. He's just like, what are we going to do? Just pretend to be insane because clearly <laughs> it's not going to work out for me very well. Gilbert Rodway, Lam Kor Wan's defense lawyer, fully endorsed this, claiming he killed because he was delusional, had no moral compass, and ultimately lacked free will. And there's a little aside here from George. If you'll allow me a tangent, dear viewers. All right, George. I guess it's not just me with my tangents today. Now, I appreciate the defense lawyers have a difficult job. Our hard-won legal rights demand even the most seemingly guilty among us to be allowed their rights to legal representation. And that can mean sometimes having to defend a bastard, etc. But in this instance, in which we have three tapes of the accused cutting up women with a big ear-to-ear -ear grin on his face, the defense lawyer happily went along with his absurd claims of insanity. I feel I have to surrender to my emotions on this one and firmly declare Gilbert Rodway. I hope filling your bank account up with blood-stained money helped fill that enormous cavernous void inside of you where a conscience should have sat. Um, I get where you're coming from, George, but he's like, this guy doesn't have any money. He's not going to be making a ton of money from defending this guy. Someone has to defend him. Is he a public defender or like 
Someone he gets for free? I don't, I mean, I don't, I, he's a lawyer. He's just, I don't want to say he's just doing his job, but he kind of is just doing his job. Is it bad to say that? People are entitled to a defense. And let's just like slam, uh, the, the evidence is slam dunk, man. Come on, he's going to get it. It's also, it reminds me of this, there's a brilliant TV show. I don't know, a few years ago now, many years ago now, maybe early 2010s, mid 2010s, called Boston Legal with uh, um, James Spader and William Shatner. And there's this amazing scene, I'm going to definitely screw up the details, where uh, William Shatner plays this very high powered lawyer and he's assigned to like some random defense. He's apparently in America, they can just be like, you've got to defend this guy. So he's defend he's, he's like defending this guy and he's accused of like raping a kid or something horrific. And, uh, Will Shatner's, William Shatner's character is like, I uh, I don't want to defend you. And the judge is like, you have to. I'm ordering you to defend this guy. And so he's in the room, like the interview room, and he's talking to his client who he's been assigned. <laughs> and the guy is just like, well, at least she's not going to suffer for long because I've also got AIDS. And William Shatner's character just pulls out a gun and shoots him in both legs. <laughs> And then immediately, of course, the uh, the the guard from outside just rushes in, and he's like, "Oh my god, he came at me!" <laughs> and he gets taken off the case because he shot his client, and he completely gets away with it. And it's like, F yeah, <laughs> great TV show. If you haven't seen that, even I, I haven't seen it in a decade, but it stand it'll stand up. It's so good. You need to watch it now. So, with this claim submitted, we're back from our double tangents. The Colonial Crown Prosecution Service now had to figure out if Lam Kor Wan was mad or bad. A team of five top psychiatrists were assembled, some bust in from Hong Kong and others flown in from overseas. They are tasked with each individually interrogating Lam Kor Wan and then jointly bashing heads and presenting a report to the court to conclude on the accuracy of his claims of insanity. The full report has never been released to the public, but from interviews, comments, and other scraps of information that can be found here and there, we can decipher quite a lot about it. Our best source is Dr. Paul Tam, a local Hong Kong clinical psychiatrist who gave an extensive television interview about it during the early 2010s. In this interview, he said, It was like a Hong Kong civil war, I can tell you. We were taking sides. Lam pleaded manslaughter, but he was backed up by two of the five psychiatrists. They defended Lam and said that he acted out of acute psychotic disorder. This meant that he was not in full control of his faculties. He is a sexual deviant and he was a psychopath. He was a quiet person. He had a schizoid personality. A schizoid person is a person who is very quiet, withdrawn, and on the other hand, very sensitive to comments made by other people. None of these mean he is not responsible for his actions, of course. One such lawyer on Lam Kor Wan's side was Australian psychiatrist David Barnes, who testified that Lam Kor Wan was suffering from serious and delayed psychosis, which apparently had been triggered by something trivial, a claim which Lam Kor Wan latched right onto and began repeating his earlier claims regarding his drive to kill being triggered by the rain. The prosecution was having absolutely none of this, and they maintained that he had in fact planned so rigorously and stuck to that plan so well it proved that he was of sound mind. To find out more, let's throw it back to Senior Inspector Martin Richmond. Quote, once the evidence had built up to show the degree of sophistication and planning, to show how careful he had been, people started to look the other way and began to think that this wasn't a spontaneous series of events. This wasn't something over which he had no control. Prosecutors also began to pore over Lam Kor Wan's interviews with the five psychiatrists and began noticing inconsistencies between them all. He was giving a different story to each of them, making small talk with them to learn their biases and prejudices before the interview formally began, and then altering his story to best suit the interviewer before him. The prosecution firmly believed this whole runaround was an attempt by him to escape the death penalty, which, as of 1983, had not yet been abolished in Hong Kong. Okay, so that's the game. He's just trying to be declared insane so he doesn't get the death penalty we talked about it previously like getting declared insane is not always you know great because then you might never be released from prison but in this case they're not going to execute someone who's been declared insane so i guess he's, he's just hoping to get away with his life ultimately the court accepted that lam kor wan did have a personality disorder but rejected his claims of insanity unfortunately for lam kor wan but very fortunately for us red-blooded justice enjoyers then as now in the hong kong legal system a personality disorder alone is not enough to absolve one of criminal responsibility it has to be proven that the disorder 
order is so extensive and destructive that it removes the accused capacity for free will a hurdle that lamb Kor wan did not manage to jump yes and again obviously there's something very very wrong with him but does he have free will yes obviously he needs to go to prison forever or be killed eventually however after three weeks of back and forth debating and pleading came to an end seven man jury were finally ready to deliver a verdict they began deliberations at 11 30 a.m and it only took a few short hours for a verdict to be rendered shortly after 3 p.m a foreman stood before the judge to proclaim the jury's verdict onto the court guilty on all counts of murder judge baber had clearly been anticipating this verdict and knew exactly what punishment he wished to doll out without hesitation he softly declared death it's safe to say that this verdict which had been returned unanimously went down well with the five people of hong kong outside the court chen fenlan's father in an interview with tvb said the verdict was very fair i will tell my daughter about it at her grave oh my lord sadly viewers i have bad news to deliver as much as hong kong technically had the death penalty in 1983 in real terms it did not the united kingdom had abolished the death penalty in 1965 and a year later in 1966 what can only be described as a political storm ensued following the hanging of one wong kai kek the last person executed in hong kong following his death the reform club of hong kong an old liberal advocacy group in the city along with many of its powerful friends and benefactors kind of successfully lobbied for the city to follow the united kingdom's example and abolish the death penalty and so from 1966 the death penalty had been suspended oh come on let's make an exception for this sicko <laughs> suspension is in this case i'm like I, he does I, I know often i'm very quick to be like death all of them now but in this case i'm like this guy i think needs to go to prison forever i think while the insanity claim is obviously bullshit he does have some clear personality disorders which i do believe somewhat mitigate this nothing close to him being able to go free but i, I don't know i just feel like he's not right in the head even though he's not not right enough to go to psychiatric care instead of prison he's not right he's not right suspension is not abolition however and from 1966 to 1993 when the death penalty was formally abolished capital punishment existed in a state of bizarre limbo in hong kong in which it was suspended so no one was executed but still technically on the books until it was formally and legally removed in 1993 at the same time many crimes such as murder still legally mandated death so during this 30-year limbo period the city's governor would simply commute the sentence of anyone convicted to death to life in prison so i'm afraid dear viewers that means exactly what you think it does for lamb corwan his death sentence was formally commuted to life in prison on the 29th of august 1984. psychology in the last chapter we hinted at lamb corwan's mental condition and his claims of insanity so let's take time to now examine that in further detail maybe this is going to re make me reassess my opinion of his mental state and it being a mitigating factor perhaps the most immediate question we have when it comes to lamb core wan and serial killers more generally is why how does a human being the same creature as you or i manage to deviate from accepted norms and values to such an extreme degree to a degree that the only human thing about them is the human-shaped husk that their evil mind occupies naturally justice systems all around the world ask themselves this exact question regularly so accordingly and as already discussed upon his arrest lam kor wan was given an in-depth assessment by five of the hong kong judiciary's retained psychiatrists it's easier or perhaps more comfortable for us to write off serial killers as monsters who are so different from you or me that they're not even human easy and comforting that conclusion may be it was not the conclusion of the five psychiatrists when they assessed lamb core when yeah i think psychopathy is not something again it's one of these things that isn't black and white we often want to look at the world in really black and white terms but the reality is it's like a sliding scale you're gonna have people some people who are just pure psychopaths with no emotion no empathy whatsoever and then you're gonna have people who have well just not very much of it then you're gonna have people who are right on the other end of the scale who have tons of it and then i think most of us are probably somewhere in the middle right 
Now, we already know that three of these five psychiatrists initially returned a verdict of sane, and it was ultimately deemed that Lam Kor Wan was not mentally ill, and in fact, he committed the crimes in perfect clarity and calmness of mind. He simply put his own warped and perverse sexual needs above the needs and rights of his fellow human beings. The final report contained some interesting deliberations we didn't go into during the discussion of Lam Kor Wan's trial. In particular, the team of psychiatrists raised seven points of consideration to help explain his actions. Number one, his seemingly overall negative family environment may have influenced his personality. Two, his social alienation from working night shifts may have influenced his personality. Three, his neglectful and abusive childhood left him forever in the shadows in his formative years. Might this have some bearing on his apparent power fixation over the women he perceived to be lessers? The report also cited some studies showing a correlation between an abusive childhood and violent behavior in adulthood. I'm not sure what these, what the point of these is. None of these, uh like oh so that's so it's okay you became a murderer because anyone can have any of these things and most of them are not growing up to be murderous serial killers this is these aren't excuses number four his brain could just be a wrong un whose brain wasn't wired upright that's that's so far the most compelling one for an excuse his brain is just wrong but he was still aware of what he was doing he wasn't that wrong Number five, even animals appear to have some manner of predisposition towards violence. May his behavior be an evolutionary throwback? <laughs> Does it matter? Number six, the killing of Chen Fen Lang appeared to have an element of impulsiveness to it, and the act of killing solidified a lingering but yet unsolidified mental state. Number seven, he had an electroencephalogram scan which came back clean for brain damage, but the report didn't rule out the possibility of some undetected brain damage due to the heavy correlation of serial killers having suffered some form of brain damage. These were only suggestions, however, and not presented as clear and defined conclusions, yet they are super wishy-washy. Dr. Paul Tam, in the same interview cited earlier, delved into his own personal explanations of Lam Kor Wan's mental condition to quote, At a very young age, he was sent to Brunei, and he certainly didn't have much paternal or maternal love. He had to grow up with his stepmothers, and his father also confessed that he was beaten up all the time by his dad. He certainly didn't have much of a happy childhood. Sergeant Lowe builds upon this with his own explanation. Like all boys, he grew up and discovered girls. Now, I don't know if it was because of his messed up childhood, but when he discovered girls, it came out all wrong. He even subscribed to foreign pornographic magazines by mail. In these magazines, he cut out the sexual organs from the pictures. Once he even went to a prostitute, but was impotent and was laughed at by the prostitute. All of this seems to have set him down the wrong path." End quote. Senior Inspector Martin Richmond commented the following, In terms of intellect, I think Lam was certainly a very intelligent man. He played chess. He had one of the first electronic chess games available in Hong Kong. Always had the game tuned up to the highest possible level of difficulty. He seemed to be a type of person who could become deeply engrossed, almost completely captivated by things which interested him. Now, how that developed to a level whereby he could almost alienate himself from the pain and suffering which he must have understood he was causing people and become so detached from that, I don't know." End quote. Sexual repression and oppression certainly seemed to be a theme of his story. He even claimed that after his arrest that the only time he had sex was with the remains of 17-year-old Lian Hui Xin. Now, if those six psychiatrists and two veteran Hong Kong police force officers were unable to fully explain Lam Kor Wan's mental condition and motivation, I, George, in my capacity as a professional internet wordsmith, certainly will not attempt to tackle these big questions, which frankly are significantly above my pay grade. Luckily, however, we at The Casual Criminalist are blessed to have the internet's premier fact man as our host, as well as a worldly and intelligent audience whose brains cascade and ripple with the breadth and depth of their many wrinkles so what do you all think i don't know maybe it's just my small brain but i'm like yes he's a bit broken yes he uh, yes it's from a rough childhood and also probably being born a bit of a psychopath without too many emotions and he went on to become a terrible person i don't think any of these like wishy-washy psychiatry things that they came up with say anything particularly in depth and i think the police officers trying to apply like a rational normal person thought process to someone who is clearly not right is kind of a futile exercise so i think that's it again maybe it's just my small brain not being able to process anything <laughs> 
Prison Life and Aftermath not much is known about Lam Kor Wan's prison life, but I, George, have been able to piece together some scraps of information here and there. Lam Kor Wan, a Category A prisoner, initially served his sentence in that old haunt of this channel, Stanley Prison, before being transferred to Shek Pik Prison, where he remains to this day. He's still alive. In prison, he purportedly has few, if any, friends, rarely talks with any of his fellow inmates, and flatly refuses to discuss anything related to his crimes. His only company is the vast mountain of literature that lines one side of his cell, which he has built up after 39 years of saving his 200 Hong Kong dollar a month as 20 pounds prison salary. Generally, he apparently reads newspapers, religious texts, philosophical texts, and perhaps somewhat worryingly, medical texts. They should not be allowing him that. He should not be allowed that. Furthermore, in his 39 years behind bars, he has never received a single conjugal visit, having been completely disowned by his family and friends following his sentencing. His father, Lam Wei Li, seemed to shoulder the guilt for his son's actions as he personally got in touch with the surviving families of his son's victims and tried to financially support their dependents. He also funded memorials to all four women in a local columbarium, and I hope you'll all forgive me for keeping the details of exactly which one to myself, as Chen Fen Lan, Chen Yun Ji, Liang Xu Yong, and Liang Hui Xin all still have surviving family who I'm sure don't wish to see their memorials become tourist destinations. A slight, ever so tiny silver lining to this quite disappointing cloud, however, is that despite spending 39 years and counting behind bars, it appears as though the Hong Kong government has absolutely no intention of letting them out anytime soon. As per Hong Kong legal code, Lam Kor Wan's sentence is automatically reviewed every five years. And at the most recent review in 2018, the Correctional Services Department concluded most firmly that they could not guarantee the public's safety if he were to be released, and that he was getting nowhere near the outside world. I think to all of that, we could respond, excellent, because he deserves to be in prison forever. Closing Remarks so sadly, that kind of brings us to the end of today's episode. For today's killer, there will be no short, sharp drop sending him straight down to hell where he belongs. Instead, he just sits there in Shekpik prison, counting the days to his death in relative comfort. It's quite dissatisfying, really, and certainly I, George, can't exactly say I'm feeling terribly chuffed with the outcome of this one. So with that in mind, let's cast our mind back to what I said at the beginning of today's episode and try to make these tragic circumstances as positive as we are able. What we have watched or listened to today was not a story of a monster to whom four young women were lost in the most brutal and tragic of circumstances. No, that framework can go in the bin. It places the monster who did the killing at the center of the narrative. Instead, remember today's story as the tragedy of Chen Fen Lang, 22, Chen Yun Ji, 31, Lian Xu Yong, 29, and Liang Hui Xin, 17. Four young women who jumped into the back of a taxi to escape the rain and due to the intervention of a monster, never made it home. Dismembered Appendices As always, I have to extend my thanks to the Hong Kong Police Force's Data Access Department who as always have been nothing but helpful and courteous with my constant nagging and requests for information. Similarly, I'd like to thank the Crime and Investigation Network for allowing me access to the raw interview footage from their own documentaries. Brilliant, George. I admire your dedication. It's really nice to see good job man good work veterans of my george's and simon's hong kong content will remember my commenting previously that the language barrier can present a serious barrier to those wishing to investigate hong kongian true crime in any meaningful depth often there's only a handful of english language sources which contain only the most scant information on a subject indeed if i had stuck to solely the english language sources for our cheng tsi kyung script the video would have amounted to bad chinese man kidnapped people oh no <laughs> despite this being a persistent problem for whatever reason it appeared to be magnified a thousandfold for lamb core wan with other videos on the man being chock full of errors that no disrespect to our fellow creators i simply don't know how they came about for example he isn't malaysian he never went to malaysia and so on, and i have no idea how this misinformation came about anyway I'm rambling and Simon pays me by the word, so I best not waffle too long. So in summary, Chinese sauce is still good. English sauce is still crap. I don't think that's waffle. It's just, uh, I, I find it interesting. And, and don't get me wrong, look, I've made a lot of videos. I have made my fair share of mistakes, like no doubt about it. Um, I try not to, <laughs> of course, but they come about because 
it's just natural and one of the biggest ways this happens is like someone for some reason or mistranslate something or get confused about something or even just accidentally say malaysia and then some other person will use that as a source and then some other person will use that source as a source and then it just gets repeated until people think it's the truth um it's that difference between like primary and secondary sources and why it can be a problem just to rely on secondary sources Obviously, my heart goes out to all the police officers who selflessly did their best to bring today's monster to justice, but in particular, my heart goes out to Sergeant Lo Da Jun, who appears to have been particularly traumatized by this case. I was unable to track him down for comment on this episode, but from what I found of his testimonies, documentary interviews, newspaper interviews, etc., it appears as though he really kicked himself about not snagging Lam Kor Wan after Chen Feng Lan's murder. For example, commenting, As a police officer, when I look back on the investigation of the first victim's body parts, we had indeed questioned a lot of taxi drivers. If only we had found Lam then, the other victims would not have been killed. End quote. This has to be a horrible feeling, so I thought I'd bring this up just to say I think he did a tremendous job, and I wish him all the best taming his inner demons and finding peace. Yeah, and I'd like to say that as well. Look, we've covered a lot of crimes here on casual criminalist and often police investigations are not that thorough and the killers go on for dozens of victims hundreds of victims and that's not the case here so i think you guys did a great job Writer for the Casual Criminalist, you spend your time neck deep in the absolute worst of humanity, and despite a certain numbness that comes from overexposure, it isn't rare for me, George, to complete a script pushed to particular emotional extremes, be it rage or melancholy, in the case of a brutal murder script, or as an inverse kind of bizarre elation or buzz following a wacky or outlandish crime story. Today, however, I have to hold up my hands and admit to being particularly affected by this video subject matter. I speak four languages and still struggle to find the appropriate words to convey to you, the audience, just how much it angers me that this contemptible piece of human waste is still alive, getting to enjoy the pleasures of life that he denied to Chen Feng Lang, Chen Yun Ji, Liang Xiu Yung, and Liang Hui Xing. Now, me having a mood on all this is well and good, but what productive ends can be yielded? Well, it turns out Shek Pick Prison allows its inmates to receive mail, and while objectively it'll achieve absolutely nothing, it will make me a little better telling him exactly what I feel, feel about him. Feel free to join me, viewers. <laughs> Send him some hate mail. <laughs> this guy. I, I, although sometimes I feel like with hate and all of this stuff, generally, <laughs> unless I'm in a particularly spicy mood on Twitter, eh, I just don't engage. Like, even if even if i see it like i don't go very deep into the comments i don't go very deep into my twitter i definitely don't check my dms very often and i i think because it's just just let them be forgotten let the monster just rot in his cell until he dies just like although this guy seems to be like he was bummed out that people knew what a piece of he was whereas most i feel revel in this so i don't know maybe some hate mail would actually make him feel i don't know it all feels a bit pointless in a way i don't know following on from my last point you'll be pleased to hear our next foray into cantonese crime is another crazy one louis look a police officer who destroyed the triads with extreme and legally questionable methods before he then embezzled 500 million hong kong dollars and fled abroad i look forward to it those ones never do as well but they're such a nice break for me <laughs> This has been an episode of The Casual Criminals. Thank you so much for watching. Thank you, George. Did I mention Jen at the beginning? She edits these and does a wonderful job. Thank you, Jen. And of course, thank you for watching or listening. If you enjoy the show, a review if you're listening on a podcast thing would be fantastic. Like, subscribe if you're watching. And I'll see you next time.